Looking to understand how to harness the power of cloud security? Our next session will provide a deep dive into the strategic application of CNAPS, sharing practical advice and guidance on when and why you should be using them. Please welcome Rob Smith, founder and CEO of Lionfish Tech Advisors. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Smith. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. I'm in Europe, uh, so it's early evening here. Um, I want to talk to you about cloud and all the problems of cloud and how you could secure cloud. But why do you care what I think? Who am I? Why, why, why should you listen to a word Rob Smith says, especially somebody named Rob Smith? Well, let me start at the basics. For eight years, I was a Gartner analyst. And in 2020, during our friend, the pandemic, I was actually lead analyst for remote access. So I actually had more inquiries than any other analyst in Gartner. And more importantly, I uh, really helped organizations transition from static on-premise to the cloud. Because prior to 2020, the cloud seemed like a nice concept where maybe we would do it one day. Then the pandemic happened and you had to have it. It wasn't a nice to have anymore. So with the cloud, you should have some perspective. First off, where's your data? Well, as I said, I live in the EU. I live in Amsterdam. And data sovereignty kind of matters most. Um, if you look at Germany, German companies won't deal with organizations whose data is outside of Germany, let alone the EU. Germany goes way beyond the European General Data Protection uh, Regulation, GDPR. Um, and so knowing where your data is stored, especially for people like me in Europe, it's extremely important. And if there's one change that happened in 2020, well, it's that the cloud became the internet, uh, your intranet. And your data is everywhere. Applications are everywhere and you didn't write them anymore. They were written by somebody like Zoom or Microsoft or Slack or any other application you can come up with a choice. So this traditional security team, and by the way, I'm a proud paranoid security guy. I've been doing firewall since the late 90s. And so I've been doing it really since the beginning with traditional network security when you ask somebody, what is a firewall? Well, it's the thing that stopped my neighbor's house from burning down when my house is on fire. That's how far back I go. And as a traditional security team, we thought about, you know, secure the perimeter, everything's fine. But obviously now your data is everywhere with apps everywhere. How do you control anything anywhere when it's all over the place? That's the basics. And so with cloud native applications, it goes a long way. Uh, they're loosely coupled microservices. So many cloud apps aren't one app, but they're like a 50 different apps behind the scenes with one GUI based on an API interface. And I can tell you these APIs are buggy as heck. And they, you know, they have vulnerabilities over vulnerabilities over vulnerabilities. And so many of them are reliant on open source solutions. And so because of this, you, you never know what's going to happen to your workloads. You may have a vulnerability in an app that just simply isn't known and hasn't been discovered. And by the way, it affects every one of your systems. And it's out of your control because you don't manage this app. You didn't write this app. This app is just something you're stuck living with. And so that really goes to a core challenge. You know, the attack surface of a cloud is, oh, native is constantly expanding. Uh, and, and as an attacker, I'm going to really look at misconfigurations. Um, I used to joke that the only firewall I ever saw properly configured was one I configured myself. And that was easy with one firewall. But when you have 
20, 30, 50 different cloud apps, how do you know? And so how are you solving this problem when these APIs are open and anybody can come in at any time and access over an API unless you've properly locked it down? Your security team more than has a challenge because yeah, I got certified in checkpoint firewalls. I got certified in Cisco firewalls. I never got certified in Slack APIs. How do you deal with it? So this really comes down to the ever increasing attack surface. There's, you know, the more cloud native apps you have, the larger attack surface you have and the more likely you're gonna have a misconfiguration. I mean, in the end of the day, you've got the network to configure, the computer, the storage, and identities, we really view that about 80% of all attacks anymore are identity-based. And what about permissions? Permissions are something that so often all users get treated equal. Well, I got news for you. IT security is animal farm. Some animals are more equal than others. Some users should be more equal than others. Why do you have the same permissions as your CEO? You need to make darn sure people who have access to critical data go under stricter controls. You can't have one policy for everyone. You have to make sure it matches who the user is. And then APIs, uh, hello, SolarWinds, you know, you never know what's gonna happen, what's in the software and what backdoor is there simply because there's an API and I can exploit it. So, how do you protect all this stuff? Well, do you like acronym HELL? Because we in IT security and we at places like Gartner and Forrester and IBC, we love acronym HELL. We love creating new acronyms. In fact, if you put in CDR and security, you won't get cloud detection and response. You'll get content driven, uh, content uh, disarm and uh, Content to disarm and reconstruct. What is that? Well, that's removing attachments that are dangerous from within a file. It has nothing to do with cloud, but CDR is something really useful because it's looking at automated feeds to look for behavior. And then of course, you know, CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management, really, truly, you're looking at the infrastructure for risks and misconfigurations. As I said, the biggest issue really we see are misconfigurations. And with workload protection, you're really monitoring and identifying suspicious or malicious activity. And with Kubernetes, you're really looking at open source and scale and management and see how it all works. And now you have all this stuff you've never heard of before, you've never played with before, how do you work with it? Does it play nice together? You know, it is alphabet soup and you definitely need help, full stop. Well, in comes two guys at Gartner, uh, one Neil named Neil McDonald, another guy named Tom Crawl. Tom Crawl happens to be one of my former Gartner analysts at Lionfish. And what they did was they looked at business impact. And they said, hey, all this stuff has to play nice together. You can't have one, you know, all these independent bespoke systems acting independently. They all have to work together under something called a cloud native application protection platform. In other words, a single platform where all this stuff plays nice together, or CNAP for short. And so maybe you've come across CNAP, maybe you haven't. The thing about CNAP is it goes a long way of let's have many things all work together and play nice together. And it's growing very much like SASE was in the beginning. When in the end of the day, when SASE started, uh, nobody had a full SASE. Now lots of vendors have full SASE. And it's the same with CNAP. Almost nobody does everything in Gartner's mythical vision of what CNAP should be, but it lowers your business impact by having a single contextual view so you can effectively make management decisions. 
That's the concept of CNAP. And then that leads me to the full definition of what CNAP actually is. And I will try and clarify some of the, the jargon with a brief history. As I said, you know, you have these agent-based cloud workload protection platforms that just work plain nice together, together with posture management and entitlement management. And all these systems just didn't work or interact together. And that left you hanging of how do I find something? How can I trust any result? I'm getting an alert out of this, but this says it's fine. And so without that level of CNAP, you just couldn't play nice together. And that leads me to the official market definition, which I'm not gonna read to you because it's right up here on the screen. And I think you can do that faster than I could say it. But ultimately what it means is take a whole bunch of siloed capabilities and jam them all into a single system, much the same way SASE did with firewalls and CASBs and ZTNA and SWG and VPN all together in a single solution. Let's look at the full lifecycle protection of cloud native apps from development to production, how we can do it, control it, secure it. That's what CNAP is all about and why you care. So it's really no longer enough to ask, is my cloud infrastructure secure? More likely, we now need to ask, is the application secure? And if your answer is the yes to that, you're dreaming, unless you've implemented some kind of solution. Because the fact of the matter is, the guys writing the apps aren't security people. This is where SecOps matters, that you're looking and protecting cloud native apps from the development process all the way through production. CNAP's really bringing the disparate security and protection capabilities into a single platform focused on identifying and prioritizing excessive risk of the entire cloud and the associated infrastructure, the, the cloud apps and the associated infrastructure. That way you can say, hey, we have a risk and our risk is medium, it's low, it's high. Oh, it's high, wait a second, I better do something because my surface is so broad, I have so many different apps and misconfigurations. But if your surface is low because you're looking at everything in real time and comparatively analyzing, how things are working, it will allow you to get a much better picture. The same way XDR did for endpoint security by bringing in network and endpoint together under a single platform. Well, this is essentially what we're talking about with CNAP. Take all your different cloud security controls and throw them in one space. And so in an ideal world, I'm agentless. You know, the more agents, the more things slow down, the more things don't work appropriately. And workload scanning, you know, agentless workload scanning has become a popular approach. And quite frankly, a core capability is CNAP. Although in workload approaches uh, have provided the best protection, you know, anything you can do in app versus a separate agent is it's just much better. And then that leads me to what exactly is CNAP? A billion different things in one. And so there's the recommended functionality and the optional functionality. There is so much here, but hopefully you recognize some of the core elements that belong to multiple teams of business risk across your organization and to find who needs what. Um, Ultimately, as I said, the concept of CNAP was to reduce acronym alphabet hell and to try and find one simplified view of everything under one pyramid all together. But the reality is nobody does all of this today. Nobody. And it gets better every day, but CNAP is a growing concept. And I can tell you what Tom and Neil envisioned this is, goes way above and beyond what's available today from any vendor out there, but we're getting there, just like Sassy was getting there. And that's 
requires all these components to play nice together under a single console. And that's what we're talking about. So let's talk about when do you actually need CNAP? Because in the end of the day, um, if I'm not doing much on the cloud, why do I care? And so how many different tools do you have? Do they functionally overlap, meaning do you have the same feature in three different tools? And what about false positives? I, I can tell you somebody owned and ran a managed security service provider. False positives, you could spend your entire day chasing false positives. And then what about different teams? Let's put it in friendly terms. Developers are children. <laughs> they have to have things their way. And if you're not working with the developers, you're going to create a lot of friction meaning the developers aren't going to be nice, they're not going to be helpful, and they're going to rust something out that has problems. You need as little friction as possible so that the developers have one view, SecOps has another view, and AppSec has their own silo of priorities. So to make sure everybody can see what's going on for what they need it to. Once again, Animal Farm. Different users, different requirements. Some users are more equal than others. And by the way, anybody who's ever had desktop antivirus knows agents slow things down. So the more agents you have, you know, I'm running three different things and running three different things means three different agents. Performance goes to heck. Why does this app take so long to work with? Well, you don't want any agents, so get rid of them. Get rid of them as much as humanly possible. And then, of course, there's crowd sprawl. I mean, how many times have you found a problem and you called up a vendor and the vendor says, oh, but that's somebody else's problem. No, that's this other vendor. You call up Microsoft, they blame Cisco. You call up Cisco. They blame Juniper. You call up Juniper, they blame, you know, it, it's a, a circle. It's a never ending nightmare circle where one vendor will blame the next vendor who will blame the next vendor. It makes supporting application security and infrastructures pretty well impossible because then you're chasing your tail, figuring out who does what. And the fact of the matter is so often somebody would have bought and deployed a solution and that person quit three years ago. Nobody knows how the thing is configured. They just know it's there and it runs. I can't tell you how many inquiries I had where they said, no, we can't touch our security infrastructure because the guy who built it left. <laughs> All the more reason to touch your security infrastructure because the person who built it left. So many blind spots and gaps and not understanding what is really in these apps and how they work. And too many of them. Uh, you know, developer who's responsible for ops, <sighs> excuse me, you just, it's so difficult to find DevOps who they'll look for an individual task. They will not look for every implement of production of how everything's working together, they're looking for their own micro segment. And so this requires tools to address this expanded scope to try and get rid of these silos, to try and expand out above and beyond one individual silo, one individual product to get one unified picture. And so that really comes down to consolidation, to get rid of all these tools to have a single point where you can see everything and everything talks to each other so that you don't have these false positives. So you don't have five different teams. So you have one overview of how it all works at any given time and an overview appropriate for the right person so that the person in charge of DevOps is seeing the developer view as opposed to the app person sees the app view and the security team sees the security view. What if you're under attack? I don't think the dev guy really cares if you're under attack or not. 
So, multi-class. If you're on this call and you're listening to me, odds are you have multi-cloud. I mean, Gartner and the other analyst firms say by next year, half of all enterprises will adopt a multi-cloud solution where they'll have multiple public cloud providers. Um, it reduces the risk for the organization because you're not tied to a single vendor. Um, it gives you better negotiations for a better, cheaper discount. Uh, it allows you to cover things like Germany to support Germany specifically while having the U.S. data in the U.S. And allows federated buying so local places like Germany can buy their own stuff. But now you have two cloud. You have two. You have Amazon, you know, and Microsoft. Oh, my. Well, guess what? You have more attack surface. You have more exposure. And that really means having the developer responsible for ops for that particular cloud and that security team for that particular cloud. You have to look at both of your organs, uh, both your clouds and treat them as separate entities. Yet under CNAP, you can see them as a single threat, a single solution, where you may have one problem in Amazon and a different problem in Microsoft. So, it all comes down to prioritization, getting things actionable. I wake up and I go into the office and the first thing I see is I have 75 new alerts, five critical, 60 medium, and 10 low. Well, obviously I'm gonna deal with the five first, easy, but what about the 60? How do you prioritize those? Because the system all said they're equal. Well, CNAP will help you better prioritize and reduce cloud native app risk by being able to say instead of 60, no, well, you know, out of the 60, well, six of them are A11, where 20 of them are even less important than low. And so this is what CNAP helps do by constantly enforcing policies and risk and remediation across your whole multi-cloud, you're able to look and analyze and say, this is what I focus on now. Because I have a limited budget, I have a limited amount of time, and it's Monday morning at 9 a.m., I can't possibly do 75 things at once, no matter how good I am as a person. And so you've got to be able to prioritize. And if you can't automate, great, one word about AI, you know, we all know ChatGPT, we all play with AI. Would you trust AI with your life at this point? I would not. Um, AI is a good tool as an assistant. It is not the end all be all, let's turn on AI and all of our security problems are solved. Yes, the Skynet joke comes into play with exactly that, but AI is just, not good enough yet, yet being the key words. Give it two years and the AI security teams, uh, AI security function will probably be much better than your security team, but that's two years. You gotta trust the human still to make that real decision if this matters or not. The AI will help assist, but you can't rely upon it. And so let's talk about some of the challenges to getting CNAP out there. Well, the biggest challenge is silos. Different organizations, different things, different responsibilities. None of them want to help each other, work with each other. You know, I have my own little kingdom. I don't want you touching my kingdom. And then, of course, there's this lo lovely, fun thing known as existing tools. More often than not, so many people have security tools deployed that are out of date that simply need to die and go away and they don't because somebody finds a reason that oh we can't possibly replace this system and the best story i have for that is the y2k bug my father if you had to ask one who in the world is most responsible for y2k 
His name would be William Hamilton Smith. He designed mainframes and software in the early 80s when they never thought there would be a need for four digits because nobody would use in the year 2000 mainframes from the early 80s. Well, guess what? In 2024, some of his mainframes are still in production. And so why is a mainframe from 2024 still being used? Good question. Because people can't be bothered to develop new software to replace that existing old dinosaur from the 80s. How it hasn't blown up yet is beyond me, but it's a perfect example here of what you have to live with. You're going to have people say under no circumstance can we ever take this system down. And there's always exceptions to rules. One policy does not work for all organizations. One policy does not work even within all organizations if you're in multi-country. You have to understand that a risk-free application isn't possible. You have to accept risk based on geography, based on data, based on who they are, who they are, what their data is, what their app is. You have to accept some level of risk, but CNAP is really designed to help you overcome that risk. But being a, a SaaS only offering, it, it tends to say, oh, well, this old on-prem stuff we're stuck with and we have nothing to deal with it. And then as I said, CNAP is young. It's not there quite yet, um, but what's there is very useful and much better than the tools on their own, full stop. So how about talking to move to a unified CNAP, which is what we all want? Well, as I just said, <laughs> these companies have tools that won't die. Um, we feel that most Decent sized enterprises have at least 25 security vendors, 50, 100 is not unheard of uh, and is pretty darn common. Um, 10 if you're uh, an SMB, but if you're an enterprise, you have at least 25, if not 50 different vendors and tools you're living and playing with. And so those tools don't play nice to each other because vendors don't like each other. And that's just what it comes down to. So you've got to figure out what we can switch to, to stick together, stitch everything together and work nicely together. And that means consolidate and automate. You know, establish a DevSecOps group with the intention to reduce friction and delivery time. That's all they do is act as the glue between everybody else. And cloud security, guess what? Your traditional network security guys probably don't understand cloud security unless they've had a crash course in it. And so you have to understand that the traditional network security team may not understand what you're doing in the cloud. And certainly look on all the existing tools that are just a feature of CNAP. CSPM, it's awesome, but it's a feature, it's not a product. Stop treating it like a product. Pull out your CSPM and put in a CNAP instead. And by the way, last but not least, crawl, walk, run, crawl, walk, run. Do not turn this on for everyone. We are not reliving the pandemic where one day to the next you have 50,000 users at home, at least hopefully not. This means you can do a pilot program and try with the least offensive group, namely you know, marketing or sales or accounting, those who, if they lose access for an hour, isn't gonna put the company out of business. Sales, on the other hand, I can't get in the system, I'm not making money for the company. So choose your pilot wisely, make sure things work and build out and slowly do five users of only IT, then 10 with a department and then 20, then 50, you get the drip. So a couple of recommendations. Identity matters most. I can really truly say that I'm you. I mean, I'm Rob Smith. Nothing is more common than Robert Smith, I tell you, in Western world. Uh, you know, I could be the lead singer of The Cure, for example. And you know, that Robert Smith is pretty darn cool. If I could impersonate him, 
I have all of his access. I have access to backstage. I'm Robert Smith. Look at my ID. It doesn't matter how good the security is. If you become that person, you have that person's access. And so that really truly means prioritize strong identity. Look for a CNAP vendor who does strong integration with identity management. Totally. And use that as the core, as the center. And reduce the complexity and deployment by looking for solutions that integrate not run in silo. And as I said, run a pilot and certainly ensure CSAPM tools are deployed as part of CNAP. You know, it's by far the weakest area is misconfigurations. Stop it. And so look for risk earlier in the development. Don't look for risk as things are in production. Look and test, 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 test. Oh, and by the way, test, 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 test some more and try and use agentless tools whenever possible and use trusted vendors and consolidated and proven vendors who work together whenever possible. So some final thoughts before I leave you for today. Forget all these individual systems. Look for a single consolidated solution that works together nicely. Forget about your existing tool that you've had for 10 years or five years or three years or one year. If it doesn't integrate with anything else, it's just a useless tool wasting resources. You know, prioritize user-friendly consoles where everything can hook into and full cloud integration with your identity access as a service solution and your Kubernetes. And of course it has to be fully API enabled to be able to ship left and look at the stack as things are developing. And, you know, support is obviously important that somebody's going to support all your components. But if you have to pay for pricing for things you already own to integrate, that doesn't make sense. You need a solution that works together but will fit within your budget. Because if it's not within your budget, there is no risk, you know, what's the risk? You always have to accept risk when dealing with a the cloud. These are not your apps, or they may be some your apps and somebody else's apps. You have to make sure that you know the risk. There is no perfect security. Anybody who tells you they can solve all your security problems simply isn't telling you the truth. You have to realize that as time goes on, Security gets better, but the hackers get better too. Never forget the hackers are always smarter than we are. And with that, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>